All right, here we go. 3.4, which is section 3.3 .3 in our textbook. Factored form of a quadratic relation. A little bit of a recall here. There are three forms or ways of writing a quadratic. We've seen these before. There's standard form, which looks like a bunch of Greek or gobbledygook. We're going to get to this later. Don't worry too much about it. All you need to know right now is that it's called standard form and that it has this trinomial format. Then there's factored form. That's today's lesson. Uh, what we're going to find out today is what the S and the T do in this equation for us. And of course, we already know vertex form. And vertex form is very handy. It gives us the following information as a quick recall. The H is the X value of vertex. And the key value is the Y value. And if it's a stretch or a compression, remember those terms. Okay, great. So that's vertex form. But we're not talking about vertex form today. Today we're talking about factored form. You might notice the A value is still there. Nothing has changed about our A value. They are the same. So it's good to know we don't have to memorize anything else. And as a matter of fact, when you get to standard form, it's the same for standard form. But what's different is this S and this T, and they're just placeholders. Just like the H and the K were placeholders, there's going to be numbers in S and T. What I do want you to understand about factored form is the term factored. I'm just gonna go off to the side and do a small little thing here. What are the factors of 18? I just kind of picked a number semi-randomly here. The factors of any number are the numbers that multiply into it. We've got 1 and 18. And someone would, some people would argue that 1 and 18 aren't actually factors of 18, but I'd say yes, they are. Now, 18 does divide by 2. It's 9 divided by 2. 2 doesn't really divide by anything else. Well, 1 and 2. 9 divides by 1 and 9, but it also divides by 3 and 3. Now what do two and three make? Well, two and three make six, and six is also a factor of 18 because 18 will also divide by three times six. We see that this way right here. So, so these are, every single one of these are factors of 18. So factored form, and you know what, mathematicians are probably screaming if they see this, but I kind of like this explanation. Factored form has factors. It has an A, now that might be our two, it has a, an S, that might be this 3, and it has a T, and that might be this other 3. So we can have multiple things multiplied to each other. Just to reiterate that, I can say that 18 is 2 times 3 times 3. And you can do this with all sorts of numbers. Again, I picked 18 pretty randomly. There's probably a bunch of better examples, like perhaps 24. Um, you know, well, let's talk about 24. What kind of factors can we think of for 24? Well, 24 is made up of, you know, 8 times 3. Well, 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 3 is 24. Or you might say, well, no, 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 no. 2 times 3 is 6, and four, 2 times 2 is 4. So 4 times 6 or 24. The, these are all true. These are all different factored forms of 24. Let's move on to the number of zeros available in a parabola. We've seen this before. Our most famous parabola of all, y equals x squared, has how many zeros? How many zeros does x squared have? Well, x squared only has one zero. I can have a parabola over here, and let's say I flip it upside down and I make it really fat. How many zeros does this have? This only has one zero. But I can have parabolas that have no zeros. All I have to do is move this guy up a little bit or move this guy down a little bit. If I, if I have parabolas that exist in this kind of realm or up here facing upward, that is an awful parabola, or up here facing upward or down here facing downward, all of those have no zeros. That is, a, that is definitely a possibility. Can I have two zeros? Of course I can. We've seen it in several examples. I can have two zeros if the parabola opens upward 
and the vertex is below the x-axis. Or I can have two zeros if my parabola opens downward. All sorts of examples, I can have two zeros, one all the way over here, one all the way over here, and this big parabola has two zeros. Now why am I showing you how many zeros something can have right after I talk about factored form and the factors of a number? Because there's a direct connection between the two. So let's go to the next slide and see what that connection is. We're gonna graph three different parabolas. This is in vertex form, vertex form A, H and K. But what's really interesting is it's also in factored form. I'll talk about that in a second. Example two is definitely in factored form. Example two has an A of one. This is my S or X minus S and we'll notice that that says plus two and X minus T and we'll notice that that says plus eight. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in example three we have A is negative two and then we have X minus S and X minus T. So example one, it is definitely in vertex form, but I wanna talk about what the squared means. What the squared means is that whatever's in this bracket is written twice. We've seen this before in our algebra. So this is actually x minus two and x minus two. It's just written twice. There's no real reason for me to write this right now other than for you to hold this in your back pocket and understand it for later. So let's go back to graphing this in vertex form. So where's my vertex? Well, this is a x minus h plus k. Well, my k is zero, so I don't really have to worry about that, but the h is two. Now, a little reminder that it's x minus h, so h is actually indeed two, which means I move to the right two, it's positive two. So one, two, and my k value, didn't it did not move up or down. What's really nice about this example is that a is just your normal one, and so I can just draw the normal parabola, one, two, three, four, like this. Nothing particularly fancy about that, but this is at an x of two. Example two is in factored form. How do I graph this in factored form? Right now, we graph this the way we normally would any other equation or function. We would just use a table of values. So I'm going to create some x values and then generate some y values based on those x values. So let's plug in negative two. If I plug in negative two into this equation, negative two plus two, well, what's negative two plus two? Negative two plus two is zero. That becomes zero. And I don't really have to worry about what this is. I mean, we could do it, negative two plus eight, that's six. Well, what's zero times six? Anything in the world times zero is zero. We really should hold that in our back pocket. So I want you to write down at the bottom here somewhere that anything, anything in the world times zero is zero. So what did I say happened when I put negative two into here? I said I got zero times six, which is zero. So y is zero. Well, let's plot that, negative two, zero. Okay, that's my first point. We could put negative one in there, so let's, let's do negative one. Negative one plus two, that's one. Negative one plus eight, that's seven. One times seven, one times seven is seven. So at negative one, I'm up at seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Woo! -hoo. Now let's do a zero. If I plug in zero for x, I get two times eight. Two times eight is 16. I'm way off the map. Okay, so I'm not gonna graph that, but that was 16. That was 16. And what about an x of one? At an x of one, I have three and nine. Three times nine is 27, it's going even higher. It's going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So I, I don't have anything else to draw. So oh, I better start going to the left a little bit. Now I wanna draw your attention. I wanna draw your attention to the first line we did, where if I plugged in a negative two, I got zero in this bracket. Why don't we pay attention to the second bracket? What do I have to plug into this second parentheses or bracket to get zero? We think about the number line or, or if it's eight degrees outside in temperature, what would it have to be to be zero degrees? It would have to drop eight. I would have to say that x 
is negative 8. That looks like a K, but it's an X. Why don't we do that? Let's plug in. Let's plug in negative 8. So if I put negative 8 into here, I get 0. 0 times anything is 0. So I get another 0 here. Well, that's interesting. I can plot that. Negative 8. 0. And I know that from this 0, I went up to that dot. That's only 1 over. So we could plug negative 9 in. Negative 9 is pretty easy to plug into this one, just like we plugged in any other number. Negative 9 plus 2 is negative 7. And negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 7 is 7. It's reflective, so good. We've got our basic shape of our parabola. And you might be wondering, how do I know where to go in between the two zeros? I have no idea where to go. We have to find the vertex. I, it's, it's awesome so far what we've found is the zeros. We have found the zeros of this parabola. That's the whole point so far behind factored form. So how do we find the vertex? Well, where does the vertex always happen? When we think about it, as soon as we find two points, let's take a look at my red one here. As soon as I have these two points that are the exact same height, where does the axis of symmetry occur in relation to those two dots? For this one, it happens two to the right, and for this one, it happens two to the left. We have a term for that. It's called in the middle, or the midpoint. So what I need to do is I need to find the midpoint between any of the two dots on my parabola. Why not do it with the zeros? Well, I, I said that my zeros are at negative eight and negative two. Because we're on a graph, it's very easy for us to count to the middle between negative 8 and negative 2. But there's also math that can be done there. We, we've already done it before with our midpoint equations. I want to recall what the midpoint of two dots is. The midpoint of two dots is the x values added up and divided by 2, and the y values added up and divided by 2. Well, the y values are 0. So that's pointless. But the x values are what's important. Let's add these up and divide by 2. Negative 8 plus negative 2. It's pretty easy to add up. That's negative 10. And negative 10 divided by 2 is negative 5. So negative 5, 2, 3, 4, 5. We saw that visually anyway, but we did it mathematically. And that's where the axis of symmetry is going to be for this particular vertex. Oh, sir, I don't know how to find out where the actual vertex is. How, how low do I go? How, low, how, how far down do I go? You've heard me sing it before. I'm going to sing it again. Plug it in, plug it in. I have an equation. Let me erase this stuff here. I have an equation. I have an x value. I don't, I'm not searching for an a value. I know what it is. I'm searching for a y value. So I'm going to plug in negative 5. Could I do this in my head? Sure, but I'm actually going to write it down. Negative 5 plus 2 is negative 3. Negative 5 plus 8 is 3. Negative 3 and 3 is negative 9. So I go down to negative 9. And there's my vertex, negative 5, negative 9. You might want to pause it here, maybe even rewind, because I just did a lot of work. I just did a ton of stuff. Now, what's most important out of everything I just did was actually finding those two zeros. And let's backtrack to the equation and discuss where did those zeros happen. Our equation says x plus 2 and x plus 8. I'm just going to kind of highlight them underneath it. Plus 2 and plus 8. But my zeros are at negative 8. Negative 2 or negative 2 and negative 8. Hmm. wonder why they're called the zeros and I wonder how I got them. Well, I've discussed it before. They're called the zeros because the y value is 0. The height is 0. So let's discuss this in terms of algebra. If the y value is 0. That means I should be able to just say, OK, well, the y value is 0. And now I have to figure out, well, how do I get 0 with this equation? 
But we already know that anything in the world times zero is zero. So if I can just figure out what does it take to make this zero, or what does it take to make this zero? Interesting. Now, of course, there's no algebra being done there. So let's talk a little bit more about this algebra. When you have a number, I'm going to make up another equation. When you have something like 0 equals 3x, well, how do you find out what x is? That's pretty easy. We can divide both sides by 3, and x is still 0. OK, cool. I remember that algebra. So let's divide both sides here by x plus 2. And that looks totally confusing and wrong. But there's nothing wrong with that. We can do that. We can do it really easily because these ones cancel. That turns into 1, just like we did when we divided by the 3 10 seconds ago. And this turns into 0 because anything with 0 times or, or divide is 0. So I end up with 0 equals x plus 8. Let's subtract 8 on both sides. And what do we get? Oh, mon dieu! X is negative 8. That's one of the zeros. That's crazy talk. And of course, we could have done it the other way around, where instead of dividing by x plus 2, we divided by x plus 8. And if we do that, the x plus 8s will cancel. And this becomes 0. And I'll subtract 2 on both sides. And I get my other 0, negative 2. Now, throughout this whole thing, you're probably wishing you could fast forward because you know that just by looking at it, it's negative 2 and negative 8. Some of you are, you know, you have that kind of algebra skill. But the reason why you need to know the this stuff, this algebra, is because you won't always be dealing with nice, simple numbers like a 2 and an 8. And an eight. You might have factors like 3x minus 7 over 2 times negative 4x plus 6. And it's the algebra that's going to get you to the actual zeros in these two scenarios. And we're not going to deal with that today, but you could hit that at some point in your mathematical career. In my next example, I have an a value of negative 2. Nothing particularly scary there. We know that it's going to be flipped upside down and 2 times taller. And I've got a factored form. Okay, this is not vertex form, I got factored form. So let's go based on what we know from the previous example. How do I make x minus 6 turn into 0? Well, x has to be 6. Okay, so x has to be 6. Well, how do I turn x minus 10 into 0? x has to be 10. All right, so let's plot 10. That's fantastic. How do I find the rest of the parabola? I know it opens downward, but that I can't, you know, find the z the vertex that way. How do I find the vertex? Well, I know the vertex happens directly between them, and I can count or I can do the math. So I know my my axis of symmetry is going to be right here. That's at an x of eight, and I could have done that using math. I could say six plus ten is sixteen divided by two is eight, right? Finding the midpoint. But how do I find out the y value of that vertex? I plug it in, plug it in. So very quickly, negative 2 times 8 minus 6 times 8 minus 10 gives us negative 2 times 2 times negative 2. Well, a negative times a positive is a negative times a negative is a positive. Whoa, you just said a lot of stuff, Brash. Yep, all you need to know is the answer is positive. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8. So it ends up being 8, 8. And my parabola opens downward. And feel free to rewind and go over that again if you need to see it a second time. All right. That was awesome. Now let's do it using algebra. Write the factored form of the quadratic with zeros at negative 2, 0 and 1, 0. So write the factored form. And 
you know, I've taught this a million times where, you know, read it in pieces and do what you see. Write the factored form. I'm going to write the factored form. Of the quadratic with these zeros. Oh, not that one. Oh, well, I wrote the factored form. Now I can plug in the values I know. I don't know y, I don't know a, I don't know x. But if this is one of my zeros, what do I plug in? Do I, do I plug in 2? Do I plug in negative 2? Because it's, it's already an x minus s. It's already negative. Don't confuse yourself. Plug in what you see. x minus s. There's no point in you know switching positives and negatives all willy-nilly like. And then x minus t. And I'm going to plug in what I see. I'm just going to plug in a 1. I don't really need to put that in brackets. So what I have so far is this equation. Wait, how'd you get plus 2? x minus a minus 2. Minus a minus becomes plus. Well, this is really the equation of, you know, a lot of parabolas. Because they don't have the a value. This could be, you know, any parabola in the world because the a value is unknown to us. So what are our zeros? Well, our zeros are negative 2. They've given it to us, so negative 2. And positive 1. All right, positive 1. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but my vertex could be anywhere because a is positive, a is negative, a is a fraction, a is a number. I don't know. It could, you know, be here, 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 here. I'm sure you get the point. So I could have any number of parabolas coming off and doing all sorts of wonderful things depending on what's going on with my a value. So how do I find the a value? Well right now with what was given to you in question a you can't. You can't find the a value with what was given to you in question a. So let's take a look at question b. They tell us that the point 4 negative 90 is on this parabola. The point 4, negative 90. Let's take a look at where that might be visually. 4, so 2, 3, 4, negative 90. Way down, 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 down. That tells us one thing right away. That tells us our A value should be negative. Because I know that, you know, in order to get down there, down at 4, I gotta be going downward. But it doesn't tell me what the A value is. So let's take our equation and plug in. I, I, I'm gonna sing it. I am. Plug it in, plug it in. We're going to plug in the negative 90 and the 4. So negative 90 for my y equals a times x is 4. 4 plus 2 and 4 minus 1. 4 plus 2 is 6. 4 minus 1 is 3. 6 times 3 is 18. Divide both sides by 18, and you get negative 5. So a is negative 5. And what that tells me is my vertex is going to be up here, and my parabola opens downward. My parabola has been stretched by a factor of 5. So my final equation, x equals negative 5, x plus 2, x minus 1. So it's not so hard. It's actually very similar to what we've been doing with the vertex form. All right, and I think that's about all I need to tell you. So we're going to do the following practice straight out of the textbook. As always, I suggest you do the first couple questions. Now I'm going to leave you with one reminder. Well, maybe a couple by the time I'm done. But the biggest reminder is where the y-intercept occurs. You're going to run into some questions in the homework that ask you to find the y-intercept. To do this, I'm going to explain intercepts a little bit. So if this is my Cartesian plane, why are they called the zeros for the x-intercepts? Why do we call them that? For x-intercepts, let me just do that over here. They're called x-intercepts because the y value is 0. So that's because the y value is 0, or the height is 0. Now, height in graphs is really, really important because that's actually the thing that tells you, you know, how much you're going to pay on your cell phone plan or what the maximum profit of a company will be. So that's why those are important to get their own name. 
So the x-intercepts have a y-value of 0. So the y-intercepts, the y-intercepts have an x-value of 0. And that's really important to understand and remember, especially for the homework. But any y-intercept in the world is at an x value of 0. So you can always just plug in 0 for the x value in order to get the y-intercept. There's a few other tricky things that have come across in this practice, but we'll tackle, tackle that together in class. Math does build on itself. You're expected to know the, the stuff as, as we go. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave me some comments, positive or negative.